Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before. Satisfy, 
satisfy us with your love. Lord, that's our heart's cry today. We want to bless you. We want to praise you. We want to thank you for another day that the sun has come up, though we don't see it much because of the clouds and the snow. Yet we thank you for the beauty of that, the majesty even of a winter's morning. Lord, the reminder that you are Lord of heaven and earth, that you are our creator, but also, Lord, we come to say that you are our sustainer. You, you sustain your creation by the very word of your power, and so we can trust you with what is going on in our lives. We also thank you, Lord, that you're not just sustainer, but you are satisfier of our hearts. Be the lifter of our heads this morning if we need encouragement. Lord, be the one who swells our hearts in adoration of you, even in the midst of these circumstances, Lord. May you be near to us. May your nearness be our good. And may your goodness be the focus of our hearts this morning. Receive the praise that is due you through your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you. Um, this uh, snow edition uh, of Allen Bible uh, Worship Gathering. Glad that you are worshiping with us at home. I want to say a special thanks to our AV team uh, for making this possible. And really, um, God made this possible through getting us upgraded in technology so that a day like this comes and, and we just keep rolling. Um, pray that whether you're in your, your pajamas and a hat or you are... Uh, you got all showered up and, and you got your coffee ready and you are you're perked and ready to go. Just pray that you're encouraged this morning, um, that you can gather in your home. And so it makes me think of in the New Testament that they would gather from house to house. And Philemon uh, being encouraged by Paul saying, I want you to encourage the church that meets at your house. So whatever that church is, if it's just you and your apartment or you as a family gather together, we want to say welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, for worship. Also, if part of your worship, want to remind us uh, to give. Uh, you can do that in three ways. We have a text to give option now, which is very easy and convenient and also secure. You can give online through our website, allenbible.org slash give, or you can mail it old school. Um, the, the postman like us doing this um, worship gathering here this morning, whether it's uh, snow or sleet, rain, uh, whatever the inclement weather, uh, postman deliver. So if you want to give in that way, I want to thank you for that. We're going to sing uh, one more song um, called The Goodness of God. And I prayed it earlier, but, you know, um, any time that we catch ourselves uh, being tempted uh, towards sin or to mistrust God, it, it'll go back to mistrusting that he's good. The original sin, the fall, of Adam and Eve in the garden was when they were tempted by Satan to, to distrust the goodness of God, that maybe he's holding out on them. Maybe he's holding out on us. And so it's good for us to rehearse the truths that we're, we're invited in Scripture to taste and see that the Lord is good. But we're also, because he's good, to put our trust in him. And we think of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that many of us know that we're to we're to trust him, trust in the Lord with all of our heart, not to lean on our, un, on our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he will make our paths straight or smooth. And so may he be our trust. And as we sing this, may he hit your heart and mine with just how good he is. Let's sing. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing 
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Think about how he's been faithful to you. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now, give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Let's sing that again. Cause your goodness is running after me, running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. Give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me all my life. And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God We will sing of your goodness, oh God. Amen. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And the second is like it, Love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This time, Jesus replaced your neighbor with one another. This new love that Christ commands of us goes much deeper than the Old Testament commandment he was quoting in Matthew. The people we have been commanded to love has expanded beyond our neighborhoods to include, well, everyone. And this includes people who might make this commandment a bit difficult, like that confrontational coworker who just seems impossible to get along with, or your in-laws who've never treated you like a part of the family. Or maybe the person you just met, who you don't even know and really need some help. You see, Jesus knew his physical time on earth was nearing an end. So in this new take on the old commandment, Jesus also made another change. The words, as yourself, became, as I have loved you. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. 
Christ's sacrificial life provides a clear and concrete example of real and true love, and He put this love on display on a daily basis with His disciples. He was patient with them, speaking kindly and showing great concern for their welfare. He instructed, counseled, and comforted them, prayed with them and for them. He admonished them for wrongdoing, and yet compassionately bore with their failings. And most of all, He gave His life, dying so that they, and we, might live. According to Jesus, this is how others will know that you are one of His followers, not because you have a shirt or a bumper sticker that says so, not because we announce it from a stage or a blog or a status update, but because they look at you, at how you live, the things you do and say, and they see Jesus. They see love. All right. Um, again, my name is Buddy Lyles, serve as lead pastor here. I want to welcome you. Uh, we, we obviously have a skeleton crew. If you're wondering if, if I am the skeleton crew, if I'm like running the camera, <laughs> there, uh, there are four men here this morning, and we are just so grateful for them uh, trekking across the snow. Um, really wasn't too bad. It was kind of a beautiful drive, actually. And, um, but we are glad that you are uh, worshiping with us. We know you've got kiddos and maybe some squirmers next to you. Uh, don't be afraid of that. Um, let them squirm. It's just a good thing to gather as a family to worship through song, but also through his word. So I want to pray, and then we're going we're gonna to have uh, a message as scaled down as I can, just in terms of, uh, I know it's a different dynamic when you're just at home and not having some of us uh, gathered here today. So would you pray with me as we open God's word? Lord, even that video right there reminds us that we can often be pulled in the direction of peripheral things, things that really are, are way out of the core of what's most important. And as that video said, what matters most to you is that you matter most to us. And when you matter most to us, because we love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord, you say that will get expressed in love of neighbor. And our neighbor may be sitting next to us on the couch this morning for worship. Our, and our neighbor could be the coworker um, that we love working with and the coworker that uh, we'd rather not see or talk too much at the office or that classmate that um, is right next to us and so may we as a church be about what matters most to you and Lord we know that we are not adequate for that task in and of ourselves but we thank you Father that you call us to be your ambassadors and so as we open your word for a few minutes we cannot understand it apart from your spirit we cannot live it out apart from your spirit because apart from you we confess we can do nothing and yet you call us who can do nothing on our own to be those who would walk in the good works that you prepared for us long beforehand help us to see that help us to hear your call help us lord to receive from you what we need in terms of instruction or lifting up of our heads of encouragement or emboldening Lord, or if we need correction, we need rebuke. Would you do what we need through your word? Thank you that it is profitable for all those things. May you be glorified and may we be fortified in our faith in you. And Lord, make our footsteps firm underneath us because they're, they're on your word. But also, Lord, may we walk in the directions and toward the people that you have put in front of us to represent you. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I gave us a riddle last Sunday, um, and I said it was for last week and today. Uh, and here's the riddle. See if you can figure it out. You can't see it, but the smell is unmistakable. And I said last week, if you have newborns in the house, that's not what he's talking about. So you can't see it, but the smell is unmistakable. You also can't read it on a page, or if you use a Kindle, you can't read it on a page but it is known and read by all people. What is it? Well, what it is, is authentic, 
Christ-centered ministry that makes a difference in people's actual lives. Or another way to say it is it's real ministry that makes a real difference in the hearts and lives of people. And here's the thing. At Allen Bible, we believe that the church isn't, a, isn't the building, it's the people. The people do gather here, but right now you're gathered in your home. We gather and we scatter to serve him as his ambassadors. God intends that. He calls every one of us his ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. And we've said that our vision as a church is to live deployed as Christ's ambassadors among our neighbors, the nations, and the next generation. However God has wired us and wherever he locates us. In other words, he's wired you maybe differently than me, probably differently than me. And he's located you in a place different than I am. You are physically somewhere else. You're in a neighborhood that I don't live in. So God hasn't called me to be the ambassador to your neighborhood. He's called you. Or he has not called um, these guys who are in the room with me today to your place of work, but he's called you there. And the question is, who, for whom has God put me here? And then when you think about that, if God has you there representing him as a parent with your family or in your workplace or your ministry among us here or beyond our walls with your neighbors, are you credible for that? I mean, do you have what it takes to be his representative, to be his ambassador with those people? We believe that God has a purpose for every single one of us. He intends to represent himself through you, to use you to make a real difference in the real people's lives around you. And some of you right now, even in this season that we're in, have been wrestling with, maybe God has opened your eyes to some things in your life where he wants you to take a bold step. He wants you to confront something in your life and you're not, and you're not sure, man, I, I'm not sure I have what it takes to do that. Or some of you, God is calling you right now in this season. He's calling you to an opportunity, a next chapter that's going to require faith to step out into. Maybe that is to impact your coworkers. Maybe that is to uh, impact some teenagers. And you may be hesitant, doubting yourself. That is, that's the default mechanism of all of us because we know down deep that we're flawed. Thankfully, God knows that, and he let us know that in his word. He says things aren't the way they're supposed to be because of sin, and yet he is in the business of reconciling the world to himself through his son and doing so through you and me. Flawed as we are, and yet called by him, gifted or wired by him, located by him, because he wants to make an etching in the people's lives around you in your children through you as parents, in your coworkers' lives, or maybe, again, through those teenagers or those kids that God is calling you to. But what the question before us is, what in the world, if we all feel inadequate, and we all know we are in some degree, what makes us credible? What makes us qualified, if you will, to make an impact for Christ in the lives of others? Well, we often, as I said, we're our own worst critics we're the ones who doubt ourselves. But Paul himself is going to help us with this idea of how in the world do I have what it takes? If God's calling you to it, how are you adequate for it? Well, Paul wasn't just facing his own self-doubts. He was facing detractors. He was facing those who wanted to undermine him, who were wanting to cast doubt on him in the minds of others, in the minds of those in whom he would poured out his life and the gospel. And we're looking at that in 2 Corinthians, where Paul is saying, here's the real stuff of ministry. Ministry is difficult, and you're going to face opposition. You're going to face underminers. You're going to face your own flaws. You're going to face hardship and difficulty you didn't bring on yourself. And it is going to bring you face-to-face -face with that, that gap between what is called of me, what's required of me, and what I really have in the tank, what I really have in the bag. And Paul, last week we began looking at what is this authentic, Christ-centered ministry that makes a difference? What does it look like? And if you turn with me there in 2 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to actually 
um, get to do a quick review as you're turning there, Paul gave us a whiff of, he gave us a whiff of what authentic ministry that changes people's lives smells like. And it may not look or smell impressive. In fact, we, we, we said that often it'll look like apparent defeat. And his detractors were saying, look at Paul. I mean, he can't make up his mind. He keeps changing his travel plans. He never came back to see you. He must not care about you. And can you really trust this guy? And Paul is answering that with it's what may look like apparent defeat in your life as well. A low period, the worst period of your life, really going through self-doubt or depression. Maybe you've really blown it. What looks like apparent defeat, Paul says, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, there's an actual victory that we are walking in, the triumphal pr pr uh, procession of God's victory through Christ and the victory that he won on the cross. He says we are part of that. So what may look like apparent defeat, Paul had said, is actual victory as God leads us always in that triumph and manifests through us that aroma, that whiff, the sweet aroma of Christ in every place. And so before we read today's passage, just a reminder, Paul said, we may not be able to see God's victory through us in the lives of others. Others may criticize that they can't see it, but the smell, he says, is unmistakable. We are intended to be a fragrance of Christ. For those who reject the message of Christ, it's the stench of death. But for those who receive it, who trust Christ, that God draws them by faith to Jesus, he says it's from life to life that that sweet aroma draws you. And the key question, Paul says in verse 16 of chapter 2, he says, just like we're looking at today, who in the world is adequate for these things? If life and death are in the balance, people's eternal destiny, who in the world am I to be adequate for that? Well, today, in addition to that smell of Christ-centered ministry, we're going to also take a look. We're going to see what credible, credible Christ-centered ministry looks like as we ask that question, who in the world is adequate for these things? Pick up with me in verse 14. Our passage is really 3, 1 to 6, but we're going to pick up in chapter 2, verse 14. I'm going to read all the way through to verse 6 of chapter 3 and then guide us through the time. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And here's his question, who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Chapter 3, 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in and of ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. This is God's Word. Well, as I said today, we're going to now see. Last week we got the smell of authentic ministry. Today we're going to see what credible ministry looks like. And Paul's ministry was being questioned by some newcomers who had begun to infiltrate and undermine him and ask the question, what is it with this Paul? And why do you follow him? And trying to basically drive a wedge between him and the Corinthians that he had shepherded, he had wept with, he had rebuked at times, he had shed tears of joy at their repentance, and even says, look, what we are, what we are, are workers for your joy. 
your joy in be, being transformed more and more from glory to glory, being made more and more into the image of Jesus. We're workers for that in your life. And these people had come in and began to try to pepper in doubt in the minds of people that Paul, again, had poured out his life in the gospel too. So the problem is, Paul's ministry is being questioned. How are you credible? There's two questions of his credibility. First, what credentials do you have, Paul? I mean, who, who are you to have this authority that you're parading around as an apostle? What credentials do you have? Second question, I'm not sure you have what it takes, Paul, to have, an, to have a real ministry that's authorized by God. And so Paul answers each of those questions first. He's going to answer the idea that he lacks credentials. In chapter uh, 3, verses 1 to 3, Paul's answer to lacking credentials. You don't have the letters of recommendation in our world today. You don't have uh, the, the MDiv or the THM or the doctor uh, behind your name. You don't have uh, the missionary training. Who are you? How would God ever use you? And Paul's answer to this question of credentials is you, Corinthians, you, living, breathing believers in Christ, you are our letters. It says, you want evidence of credible ministry? Look at the life change all around you. Look at your own transformation as God has been doing a work in you since he sent Paul there to share the gospel. People came to Christ. God founded and established the church Paul has been pastoring and shepherding and exhorting and sending other ministry teammates to encourage and to help them in their walk. He says, you, you are our letters. Now, here's what I want you to understand. When he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need a sum, letters of commendation to you or from you? He's actually addressing that the, the, the detractors, are they have their papers, they're authorized by uh, someone else saying, hey, we commend, you know, uh, so-and-so, Joseph or David or whomever it is. We commend them to you, and it's a letter, and you can pull it out. And Paul, he's not saying letters of commendation are bad. Back then, that was very common. You had a lot of itinerant ministry, meaning they would travel around. So you show up someplace, and you just start talking. Like, they'd be like, who are you? And you say, oh, well, here I am. I come from this school, this training, or this well-known and trusted teacher uh, gives their recommendation. We do the same thing, right? When you go to a job interview, nothing wrong with that. You, you better have some letters of reference. You better have some resume that shows I've actually worked somewhere and didn't get fired from 12 places, right? These are important things. Paul's not saying those are bad. In fact, Paul himself in Romans 16 commends Phoebe to the Roman church. He writes a letter of commendation for our sister Phoebe, he says. And so Paul is not saying those things are bad. But he is saying, I'm not interested in paperwork. Paperwork is not what authenticates Christ-centered ministry life-changing ministry it's not the degree it's not the diploma that's in a nice frame that's not what authenticates ministry he says what we need to look at is how god has changed your lives corinthians in fact you could almost hear paul he's he's taking a shot at his opponents by saying i don't need as some these letters he's taking that shot but he's also saying to the corinthians in a sense really really like you guys they're undermining me they're casting doubt like that's causing you to wonder if i'm really credible like do, do i need to go dig up my transcript is that what you're saying i mean in in our setting you could say well buddy i don't know i mean we've been in this church you know six years but i'm not sure if you you have the credentials i mean we could I think we could still dig up my DTS diploma, um, my Auburn one. You may think, you know, that's not exactly an academic uh, juggernaut, but 
but but my DTS diploma, I have a master's of theology. I mean, we can go find that. I have an ordination from Dallas Bible Church, but but honestly, I'm with Paul here. I don't even know where those things are. They're somewhere in my house, probably, or in some filing cabinet. I hope when I'm cleaning out my files here in, in a week or two that they don't get thrown out, but I mean, that's what I would do. It's like if, if, if I knew you from life group or I knew you just from ministry settings here and, and you're like, well, I kind of need to see your transcript. And we can go find it, but really? And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying the evidence of credibility, credibility in ministry is not through paper, but it's through people. And he says, you Corinthians, you of all people, you are our living letters. And his heart is for them. He says, look at how your own lives have changed. What I want to tell you is, as a church, this is what we are after. We are, we are after God using us, God using you in your neighborhood, God using you in our kids' ministry, God using you uh, in our partnerships locally with uh, other churches or ACO, God using you in your Workplace, God using me however he wants to see fit so that his word is etched in the hearts of others and they are transformed by God's word and his spirit using that word through my life, through my life being poured into yours, through your life being poured into that person, those people, that ministry opportunity that he has in front of you. I have um, uh, a friend back in the day when I did young adults ministry down in Dallas. We were closer to Dallas Seminary, so there were people there getting their letters, if you will, and that's a good thing. I believe in training. Uh, I wouldn't have gone or wasted money if, if I thought it was a waste. Um, but this one guy in our leadership team, he was part of our, um, he led one of our men's small groups, and he was learning a ton, and we were trying to, trying to train him up, and now the time had come he's graduating, he's interviewing, and he interviewed with pretty sizable church that was making a, a huge impact in the lives of young adults. And as he was interviewing, uh, I called him and said, hey, how'd that go? And he said, I, I think it went well. I think it went well. I, I'm kind of second guessing a couple things I answered. So I was like, okay, well, I knew him. I knew, I knew he had all the, the right knowledge and I knew he'd had training under me and a few others. And I knew he'd been doing ministry. I knew he'd actually got to been using him to affect lives, but it started to make me think, oh no, I wonder how it went on the other side. Well, that guy called me, and he said, hey, I wanted to inquire about, you know, um, your, one of your leaders who's uh, interviewing with us, and he said, I said, well, how'd it go? And he goes, well, I mean, there was a lot of good stuff that he had to share. He said, but something, I felt like something was missing, and he said he, it was almost as if he was just sharing with me the textbook answers. And then I was like, oh, because I knew that um, my friend had that tendency, like, I want to make sure I don't say the wrong thing, so let me say the, the thing that I know is in the fairway, right? Well, what ended up happening was this interviewer was letting me know. He didn't use these words, but what he was saying was, I kept waiting to hear about the living letters, I kept waiting to hear about the, the young men that he was discipling. I kept waiting to hear about when he taught the interaction that he had with his students and the life change that he saw. I, I kept waiting to hear about the people that he had shared Christ with. He's like, but all I heard was the textbook. I was like, oh. And so when I called my, my friend back, he's like, man. And I said, you, you've done this. Like you've agonized with guys in prayer over something really important in their life. You've discipled them through crisis. You've helped them look at their work from an eternal perspective. You've done all those things. And he's like, I didn't share any of that. He didn't get the job. Why? Because ministry, real ministry, that affects real people's lives and brings about change is when God does that work through you in the actual hearts and lives of people. It's not just having paperwork. It's not having the perfect answer. And Paul is saying, you Corinthians, you are my living letter. He had a, a pride and a satisfaction and a joy of that. There was heart exchange. And so my question to you is, God intends for every one of us, 
He intends for you to impact teenagers, to impact your coworkers. Who are your living letters? Who are your living letters that are already in your wake because you've, you've invested your life and the gospel in their life? Or who are your living letters that God says, those are the ones, I want you to pour your life, I want you to, to invite them to be with you so that you might invest my word in them. But then the second question is, whose living letter are you? As men on Tuesday, we shared, who's a man that really impacted you? And it was great in our small groups to hear of men that we'll never hear of and how they had impacted some of our men here and how that still stirs in their heart today and, and, and kind of girds us up to keep moving on to say, okay, God used that man in my life. He doesn't intend for what he poured into me to stop with me, but to pour, be poured out as an overflow in the lives of others. A couple of thoughts here. On a weekly basis, I would say I am encouraged personally to hear from some of our church's living letters. Young adults now who grew up here in our kids' ministry, our student ministry, they came to Christ here. They were baptized here. They, we encourage them, you're part of the body too. You're not just, you know, an add-on as a kid or a student. And to see many of them now changing lives through ministries like Young Life, where God has them, or on their college campus, or some of them even in churches, many of them now going in with a, a, a worship mindset into their business, engineers living out their faith and integrating it with where they are. There are living letters, and I'm encouraged on a weekly basis hearing from some of you. Also, I would say that in my second question of whose living letter are you, I, I took a little bit of time, and I would encourage you as a way to apply this for God to stir your own heart, is write a note of thanks to somebody that God used to etch into your heart. He says, you're written in our hearts. And he's also talking about God's word being inscribed or etched in their hearts. And so I, I sent two notes this week to men whom God used to shape me, to correct me, to call me on the carpet when I needed it, but particularly to point me again and again back to Christ, back to my trust in him and where my hope, as we talked about, was off and wasn't set in him, and to point me and call me to a sincere devotion to Christ and to not be about myself, but to be about, as we said in the video, loving God and loving my neighbor right where he has me, even when I don't feel adequate. And that's the second thing I wanna to move to Quickly, Paul was questioned, what are your credentials? He says, it's not paperwork, it's people. Secondly, who in the world, or how in the world are you adequate or sufficient? Paul would say this. In verse 16 of chapter 2, if you look back up, he says, who is adequate for these things? I mean, somebody's life being changed from, from death to life when they come to Christ? To speak the gospel knowing some won't respond, but then to speak the gospel to others, and we know our presentation wasn't good. We know we left parts out. We know that we botched it, and yet God moved and they came to Christ, or maybe they're already a believer and God already used you. He says, who is adequate? And what he wants us to answer in verse 16 of chapter 2 is, well, no one. But here's what I want to tell you. That's not the answer. The answer, who is adequate to represent Christ? Who is adequate to have authentic ministry that really makes a difference? The answer to that is that no one is self-adequate. And like he was talking about with these letters, no one is sponsor adequate. It's, it's fine to get sponsored. It's fine to be commended by others to help introduce you. But our, our adequacy is not self-adequate. It's not sponsor adequate. But it's the Spirit of God making us adequate. Look at verse 4. He says, We have... Uh, such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we're adequate in of ourselves, so we're not self-adequate. To consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. So God is our adequacy, but we would stop short there, and here's what I want to give us a caution of. Beware of feeling like false humility is how we show Christ-likeness. So when someone says to you, man, I just really appreciate you have been such an encouragement to me. God used you in my life to go, well, oh, well, you know, that wasn't me. That was God. And I get it. But what we're doing is we're dismissing. We're actually 
cheating God of glory with a false humility. Now, we can also cheat God of glory by going, you know, I've really been working on that. I, I'm glad you noticed. And, uh, you know, like the, the hype machine gets going. But I think more of us are actually in that woe is me, Eeyore. We think that is Christian maturity. No. He says God made us adequate. In fact, you think about it, really three quick things. We have elder qualifications. Who's qualified to be an elder? You ought to have a big lump in your throat if you're ever approached about being an elder, big lump in your throat and saying, I am completely humbled by this. That is an appropriate response. Yet you know that God includes those qualifications in a couple places in Scripture because God intends not perfection, but he intends those qualities to be on display and consistent in a man's life is he if, if he is called to be an elder. God is the one who makes us adequate if that is our serving role. Second thing, again, it's not that no one is adequate, it's that God makes us adequate by his spirit and his word. Second Timothy three, sixteen and seventeen. All scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable. It makes a difference. And he says it's profitable for, for reproof for correction, for instruction, for training in righteousness. Why? That the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And the word pictured there is, is right in line with this one. Who's adequate? Who's sufficient? Who's fully furnished to carry out the ministry that God's putting in front of them? The answer is no one being self-adequate, but God fully furnishes us. God says that gap between what you got and what I'm calling, what's going to be necessary to make an eternal difference, that's where faith is necessary. That's where I show up and display my glory. Be available, give me your loaves and fish, and I will multiply. And Paul says, that's the thrill of my life. Last one, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. Peter gives us the shortest catalog of spiritual gifts. He just divides them into serving or speaking. And he says, as each one of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then he says the two categories. Whoever speaks, do so as one speaking the utterances of God. Don't hold back, be bold. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving, how? By the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. So it's God who makes us adequate. It's actually God who supplies what we need because he knows what is needed in the life of the person he has put you in the path of that they might be a living letter, a record not of how great you are, but a record of how gracious God is to work through you. As we'll look in 2 Corinthians 4, we're all a bunch of cracked pottery, but through that, the light of Christ can shine through those hard times as we looked at last week, the aroma of Christ can fill the room that we're in, can fill the relationship that seems broken and in need of repair. God intends, he purposes you to be the one that would make a difference in the lives of others. It would be him doing the difference making through you being available. Because he says that in Second Corinthians, it's God who makes us adequate. It's God who writes his word, who makes the difference in the hearts of people. Well, we all struggle with that. Some of you right now, you are, you know, some of you very specifically, you know God is calling you to something and you gulp. And you're like, there's no way. And you think, you know what? I just need to play it safe. I just need to tuck back here and God's saying, trust me. I already know what your weaknesses are. I already know what your limitations are. I know the gap. But in that gap, I delight to show off my glory. And in that gap, you stepping forward to give me what you do have, and I'll make you adequate. I want the aroma of Christ to be sweet. And I want the, what's seen and visible through your broken life, the, my grace being sufficient, my supply being sufficient. I want to use you to change the life of others. So if you struggle with that adequacy, you're right. No one is self-adequate. No one is sponsored adequate. It's not about paperwork. 
but it is about being available to him that he might use you in a thing that you know is above your pay grade, but it's not above his. And he delights in working through us. I want to share, I, I, I often struggle with wondering, am I making any kind of dent? Um, two areas, I, you know, wondering if it'll make a difference. One is a, as a dad. Um, you know, with five, you get, you get to have that magnified, <laughs> your inadequacy, your in over your headness. Love our sons. And I, I love seeing how God is, is developing them. But it's also hard when you see them going through difficult times, when you see them struggling, when you see where their, their deficiencies are in terms of their maturity or where they need to grow, and how do you not just, whoosh, you know, how do you be patient? It makes me think how thankful I am for the patience of my Heavenly Father. It makes me think of how thankful I am for um, men that were patient with me. As I said, I wrote a note even this morning to a man and just said, thank you for how patient you were and have been with me. I'm the man I am, and I am the man I'm becoming in part because of your availability to God using you. So as a dad, am I doing enough? Am I botching this whole thing? And if you're a parent, I know that that hits home. As a student, maybe you're a high schooler, maybe you're a kid, and you think, I'm, I'm just not, how would God use me? I'm just little old me. Um, I can tell you that God used my friends when I was in high school, my friends when I was in elementary school, to encourage me when I was down. He can use you, but we have to be available. And then um, I was encouraged personally because I also not only struggle, am I making a dent as a dad? But do I make any difference at all in ministry? And there's much that we can beat ourselves up about. But just God was so kind. Uh, he encouraged me through two men this week, um, thanking me. And they didn't use the terms again, but the way they talked about it was they were letting me know, I'm one of your living letters, buddy. And that's very humbling. That's very kind of God. And God is that way. He'll be that way with you. He'll fully supply. Because he's the one who knows the difference he wants to make in that life of somebody that, that he has you there for. That they might be a living letter of yours, but it'll be God who wrote on their hearts through you. And he'll etch them in your heart as well. As Paul says in Thessalonians, we were well pleased to not only impart the gospel, but our very lives. And you have become dear to us. We have such a fond of for you that is life and life to the full God intends that for you so my encouragement is none of us wants to go I don't really want to make a dent in life I think we're actually all haunted by I don't want my life to be empty and not really make a difference we, we're haunted by that and Paul uses this phrase over and over again not in vain not in vain he tells the Galatians, I believe, it was not in vain in my coming. I think the Thessalonians as well. It's what we ended with last week. If you want your life to count, if you want it to not be in vain, the good news is that we are already being led. You're already being led in this triumphal procession. It's God who's leading, and it's God who's going to manifest the sweet aroma of Christ through you, and it's God, God who's going to manifest living letters, living letters, visible tangible evidence that God's at work through those of us who avail ourselves to him. And he says, I delight in doing that. And so my benediction to us today is simply this. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work in the Lord is not in vain. It's not about paperwork. You don't need credentials. Get training, sure, but be available, and God will fully furnish what you need so that his son is on display and lives are changed. May he make us a church that just relishes living letters. 
Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your grace in our lives. We acknowledge we've got weaknesses and shortcomings, but we thank you that you know us intimately and you actually want to use those limitations to draw us to you in dependence, utter dependence, but you also want to use those weaknesses, those cracks in the pottery of our lives so that we are approachable, that we are not perfect, we are not sealed off from people, but they are actually drawn to us through our brokenness and through the Christ in us. Would you do more than I know how to ask or imagine through the lives of everyone listening today? And may you grant us courage to follow you, to follow you where you are calling us, even if we feel inadequate, knowing that you're the one who will make us adequate for the task to which you have called us. Be glorified through this church and through each of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Stay warm. Actually, go have a snowball fight. Have a great day.